Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two man car, Jess Romero, Ruben Nava. Here we are every Tuesday and Thursday talking about muscular Christianity. And boy, oh boy, if you want to know how one becomes a muscular Christian, I'm going to tell you. I think the Latin Mass has a lot of what I would call Catholic CrossFit training to make your soul muscular. And we've got the perfect, what I would call, spiritual fitness trainer in this area. He's going to take us through some, some intellectual Catholic calisthenics. Here's a friend of mine. His name's Peter Skwasniewski. I met Peter a few months ago, probably a year ago, over at a meeting uh, over in Miami, Florida, with other, other Catholics that are trying to make a difference in the church. And uh, Peter, welcome to the Jesus 911 show. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. Welcome. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Ruben. And, uh, so, yeah, so I got Ruben, my partner. We're a two-man car. Let me just tell you a little bit about my, my background, Peter, before I get into uh, asking some questions about your incredible book. I'm about a third done with it. It's called The Genius and Timeless Myths of the Traditional Latin Mass, Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright. Um, Ruben, my partner on this show, uh, we've been good friends for many years. We worked uh, as, as uh, deputy sheriffs uh, for the LA Sheriff's Department. And very early on, Ruben discovered the Latin Mass. And it's funny. We had like this 25-year sparring match, intellectual verbal sparring match. And uh, all I could say is, Ruben, you were right. That's all I could say. I, 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 I've surrendered the white flag. Jess, Ruben, you got a comment? I was just, well, you know, Jess, uh, to be fair, you uh, were heavily involved in apologetics back in, the, in, the, in your beginning. Uh, yeah. So um, you were really concerned about winning souls to, to bring them back into the church and bringing uh, Catholics um, that have left the church back into the church and, and also our separated brethren. And my response was, well, what are you going to bring, bring them back into? You know, yeah. <laughs> you used to always say that. Be, right. You're going to be watered down. Catholicism they are going to leave again. You know, so um, it, it was it was fun. And it's good to see Jesse has been red pilled. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, let's talk about you. Uh, um why did you write this book? I'm so glad you did, but I've been following a lot of your articles for years. I guess this is a compilation of just your systematic defense of the Latin Mass throughout uh, these years, and you just said, "Hey, let's time to put it in a book." Is that uh, or why did you write the book? Did you think it was timely yeah. right now? So, I mean, basically, like the easy answer to the question is, um, I do have a lot to say. Uh, I hope a lot of true things to say about traditional Catholicism and. The way that I can do it is to target one topic at a time and write an article about it, write an essay, uh, where I really nail home that point. And over time, I try to think about what kind of book I want to produce at the end of that. Um, and so this book really was was meant, uh, you know, compared to all the other things I've done, this is meant as like a handbook of apologetics connected with the traditional Latin Mass, uh, which is obviously something you can relate to. You know, we need yeah. apologetics at all levels. We need. Christian apologetics, you know, why God exists, why Jesus Christ was necessary for the human race. We need Catholic apologetics, right? What about the Virgin Mary? What about papal infallibility? What about the, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? And then I think we need traditional Catholic apologetics as well. Mm. Um, what is the importance of our tradition? Why should we worship the way that ca Catholics have worshiped for a thousand or 1500 years or more? You know, why should we express our reverence in certain ways, like kneeling to receive communion on the tongue? You know, so that's where that's the level of apologetics that I'm at. And it might seem like inside ball, you know, somebody might say, well, the world is full of atheists and and relativists. You know, shouldn't we be talking about more basic things? And my answer to that question is, we become believers, not just at that high abstract level of is there a God or is there not a God? We become believers when we see the faith of the church represented clearly in front of us in the mass, in the beauty of the liturgy. You know, people's hearts are touched by the, the depth of Catholic tradition. And that's what convinces a lot of people to follow our Lord. It's, you know, it's not always just the the abstract questions that they're interested in. They want to see what it looks like 
if we really believe that God is present among us, what would that look like? And I would maintain that when you go into a Latin mass, you can see people who believe that, you can see priests who believe that, and you see a liturgy that reveals that to you. Um, and so for me, that's, a, that's an epiphany, that's a theophany of God's reality. And we need that if we're going to win over the atheists and the agnostics and the indifferent, you know, and so on. You know, Pete, uh, and I'll let Ruben jump in, but Ruben, my partner here on the radio, he used to always use kind of the same argument with me. He used to go, but Jess, the vast majority of the saints in the church, this is the way they worship. And that was a very powerful argument that Ruben used to use when we would discuss these things 25 years ago. And, and But that's exactly, again, I, I read this one section in your, chap, in, uh, in your book where you talked about that. It was so powerful. I just... I can hear Ruben's voice all over again. Uh, <laughs> the, mass, yeah. the mass of all the saints and all the popes. Yeah, except Ruben would these, always say, yeah. Except for these last three popes. Huh? Yeah, Ruben would always say, Jesse, that's the mass of the ages. I, I remember that that phrase, the mass of the ages. And you have it right here in chapter one. It was It was phenomenal. Yeah, this mass, this is the mass that over 200 popes celebrated. And then you go on and on. It's just a treasure chest of information. Mm-hmm. Uh that was a very powerful, powerful section. Just chapter one, the way you just laid out chapter one to me was just, it was, uh, you synthesized everything and now you're starting to defend it as the chapters go on and stuff. But uh, Ruben, you got a question for uh, Peter, Dr. Peter? Yeah, I, I was taking a look at, I was um, amazed at, at your <laughs> your uh, bi- bibliography, or excuse me, not your bibli- your, your I was reading about about you, uh, professor, and uh, all the places that you've taught it, and and uh, you know all the the publications that you're involved with. That those are all the the things that we're reading here. You know, we 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 glean from uh, one Peter five, Lysite News, yeah. Rotari Celli, the Remnant, all, Catholic Family News. I, I subscribed to that for years. You know. Uh, uh, Jesse wouldn't have any when I try to. Uh, I would. I would read it too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Get out of There's here. Good, there some good articles, <laughs> but uh, you know, and uh, the the places that you've taught it. Uh, and are you? I, I just. I'm just curious, Professor. Um, what drew you to the Latin Mass initially? Because um, you, you're about our age. Yeah. And yeah. You went, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just short of fifty, uh, so I I, I like what, to what, say what, it's, what, almost, <laughs> it, it, it's almost a. a um, uh, a matter of pride that I get to say that I was born after the Novus Ordo was, was invented, right? Because there's no nostalgia for me, right? I don't remember it at all. I didn't grow up with it. Um, I went to a, like St. Suburbia's parish, you know, with the beige carpets mm. and, and the, actually it had purple carpet, which was worse. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the band with the synthesizer and the guitar and, you know, all the usual Haugen Haas, uh, you know, music and all that stuff, right? So, I mean, that my gr- my growing up in the church was absolutely conventional post-Vatican II. Um, so it's not like I grew up in some kind of rad trad family or something, you know? I, I was the one in my family who was the most, for what for whatever reason, it still puzzles me at times, but in high school, I, I, I just became more and more conservative. For example, I started listening to classical music and it just really spoke to me. Like, there was something about it that seemed more, more beautiful and more complex and more interesting than the rock music and the pop music that I've been listening to before, um, just because that's kind of the staple diet that everybody has, you know. And so things appeal, beautiful things appealed to me, um, orderly things appealed to me. Um, but I guess what you know, really, it was kind of an accident, you know, that I stumbled into the into the Latin Mass. I went to a college certainly known to you, Thomas Aquinas College in California. Um, I went there seeking great books, seeking a great books education. I wasn't going there. I mean, I, I did go there because it was a, a conservative it's Catholic conservative, school. Right. I wanted a great books, liberal arts education. That's what I wanted. Um, and when I was there, one of the chaplains was secretly celebrating the traditional Latin mass. Mm. And uh, you know how it was back in those days. This would have been like the early 90s. It was kind of a, uh, you know, pss, pss, there, there's a Latin mass tonight at 7 p.m. You know, <laughs> pass on the word, right? Yeah. And so it was, you know, definitely a hush-hush kind of affair. But um, I just, you know, my impression was just of a, of a powerful encounter with the living God, Um like so, something so powerful that it can't be put into words. And that's why the silence of the Latin mass is so important that we are, we are coming face, 
face to face with the presence of one who exceeds all language and all praise. So we have to use words and we should use music and, and all the beauty that we have. But also there's a moment when we fall silent and we enter into that, almost that cloud of unknowing, that dark cloud, like on Mount Sinai, you know? Uh, and in fact, there are, there are treatises in the mass that compare the priest going into the canon to Moses going up the mountain, right? Alone by himself to, to, to come face to face with God as our mediator, right? So I think, I mean, I couldn't have put all of this into words. In fact, I think initially it was mostly just a kind of cathartic, emotional, intuitive experience that this is a sacred uh, you know, event taking place. And then as I learned about it more and more, I just saw, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, what they're doing makes sense. Mm -hmm. What the priest is doing, all the genuflections, you know, the, the vestments he's wearing, uh, you know, the postures of the faithful, all the kneeling, you know, it all just clicks together and you don't see it right away, but piece by piece, it clicks together. Mm -hmm. I, Dr. I, Peter Kaznewski, how can people get your book? Uh, the book is called The Genius and Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass. How can people get the book? Yes, they can. Uh, do, you have a do you have a copy of it there? Right here. Okay, good. How do they order your book? How do they order your book? Um, so they just just on Amazon. It's uh, it's from Angelico Press, and people can go to the Angelico Press website uh, and find the link there, or they can okay. go to Amazon. We'll be right back with Dr. Peter Kaznuski on the Latin Mass. Apologetics on the Latin Mass. Be back. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year round. May God bless you and your family. Tummy. How does the baby eat? Can the baby hear me? How did the baby get in there? Wow, a pregnancy can sure generate a lot of questions, but what's important is that a baby is a baby inside and out of the womb, not just after birth, but nine months before at conception. That's right, every baby is a miracle. Hello, my name is Marianne Kuharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance, or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org, or better yet, simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the key word pro-life. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. A baby's heart is beating 18 days from conception. Pro-life across America, the billboard people. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, two-man car, but today we have a ride-along. We have uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Am I saying that right? Professor Kwasniewski. Kwasniewski. He's a yes. Thomistic theologian, liturgical scholar, and choral composer, and is a graduate of St. Thomas, Thomas uh, Aquinas College in California. Are you originally from California, 
professor? Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, and then I grew up in New Jersey. Oh, so uh, I, I went from one left coast to the other left coast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, you, you've taught, uh, you've taught at the International Theological Institute in, in Austria at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, Austria's program, then helped establish Wyoming Catholic College in 2006. Wow. And uh, you taught theology, philosophy, music, and art history and directed the choirs until leaving in 2018 to devote yourself full-time to writing and lecturing. Today, uh, you contribute regularly to many websites and publications, including, as I mentioned earlier in the first segment, Lune Liturgical Movement, 1 Peter 5, LifeSite News, Rotary Chaley, the, the Remnant, and Catholic Family News. And you've published nine books, including three previous books on the, the uh, tradition, traditional Catholicism, Resurgent in the Mist of Crisis, Angelico, twin, and uh, Noble Beauty, Transcendent Holiness, and Tradition and Sanity. Uh, your work has been translated into at least 13 languages. That's, that's quite a resume um, and bi- biography. So uh, we can anybody can get your books, uh, Doctor Peter, by going to Amazon.com, typing yes. them your name, and all the books line up, right? Or Angelico. Exactly. As as long as they can spell the last name properly, otherwise, yeah. you know, no cigar. <laughs> hey, <laughs> just kidding. No, it's easy to find. Professor, one yeah. um, one question, one thing I I, I would uh, tell Jess when we were having our little di- dialogue back in the day. Um, that that Catholics uh, once what Catholics once were we are you know and uh, if we yes. are wrong then Catholics through the ages have been wrong and there's that uh, it's a pretty uh, popular uh, quote I, I, it's attributed to a Robert uh, De Piante it says we are what you once were we believe what you once believed we worship as you once worshipped if we are wrong now you were wrong then if you were right then we are right now. Is that make, yes. it's so so, so that's sense. that's brilliant yeah that's one of those lapidary sayings that just says it all right i mean you could you could just stop on that and say okay here's traditional catholicism in a nutshell you know yes um but it really is true i mean let's let's face it i mean the, the church history is full of chaos difficulty anarchy confusion heresy schism it's every it's all there you know ch- church history is is far more uh complicated than any soap opera any plot that you can imagine <laughs> but but the teaching of the church was clear. There were, there were battles over it. Great saints rose up, great theologians, ecumenical councils met, uh, popes taught uh, infallibly or you know, using other means of teaching. And the, what the Catholic church held was clear um, and how the Catholic church worshiped was also clear. And, and what her priorities were was absolutely clear. God first, you know, the soul, the salvation of the soul, second, the neighbor, the good of the neighbor, including missionary work and conversion, third, and the body, the health of the body, and even the health of the natural world, fourth. Okay, these are the priorities of Catholicism. And they're all important, but in order. And if we get the order wrong, we throw off everything. Um, the age, the age after the Second Vatican Council is characterized by massive confusion about the basics of the faith even what Christianity is, even what Catholicism is, what the liturgy is, you know, who it's for. Is it, is it a meal? Is it a sacrifice? Is it for God? Is it for the community? How do we put all this together? The church understood these things. She had a clear explanation of all of them, right? And, and that's what you find embodied in the traditional rites of the church. So they're very important for recovering our sanity. You know? So here, here, here's a question that I used to have for Ruben. I want you to answer, Dr. Peter. I used to say, man, what's this fuss all about, Ruben, about externals? Does it really matter which way the priest is facing or what language the mass is in? Come on, we have our Lord Jesus Christ. What else do yes. we need? Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 you're right. I mean, there's a there's a really serious danger of what I call reductionism in the liturgy where you where you reduce everything to the simple fact that Jesus is present. Now, that's a hugely important fact. That's what separates Catholics from from all other Christians. We have the real presence. We should be proud of that. We should be humbly grateful for that. But everything we do in the liturgy, the liturgy is the public, solemn, formal, official worship of God by the church. It's not a group of individuals making something up. It's the church's worship. And everything that's done in that worship from the start, from the ring of the bell at the beginning until the very end is symbolic. It means something. What we do, how we do it, or whether we don't do it, that all sends a message, right? So if we want to have a proper understanding of 
of the real presence of our Lord and the miracle of transubstantiation, we need to surround it with genuflections, with incense, with, you know, bowing, with, with kneeling for communion, right, with um, Gregorian chant, with Latin, with silence, right, all of these things point again and again, this is the awesome mystery that's taking place. And if we don't do that, we are going to lose our faith in the real presence. And then in a certain sense, it won't even matter in a certain sense, whether Jesus is there, because if we're not disposed to honor him and believe in him and worship him, it's not going to benefit us, right? Yeah. Remember, worship, it's for God, but it's for our benefit, right? There's a paradox there. Yeah. We're, we're doing it to glorify and adore God, but not because we're going to make him better, yeah. but because we're going to be better when we do that. So what we do and how we do it makes a huge difference for our own sanctity. That's why we're going to the liturgy. You, you know, Father, uh, excuse me, Professor. Um, <laughs> I'm a father too. <laughs> you know, um, I, I've heard some of my uh, my Nova Soto friends saying, "Well, uh, if why why would they have a mass if no one's going to be there?" You know, uh, God doesn't need us to be present. You know, um, he he does it for yeah. us. But he doesn't. Yeah, that's right. And, and about that, that's really an interesting question, right? Why is it that in monasteries, you know, if you go to a traditional Benedictine monastery, you see every morning at around six or six thirty, all the monks, the monk priests come out of the sacristy and they all go to these private side altars right. and they celebrate mass by themselves or, or with a, with a server. So right. just just the server and the priest. Why do why are they all doing that? There's no congregation, right? Right. They're, they're doing it not only to glorify God, but also so that each priest can give him the most perfect worship that we're capable of giving and to do it on behalf of the church, right? He's praying for the church uh, suffering in purgatory. He's praying for the church militant on earth, and he's honoring the church triumphant in heaven. I mean, that's the reason for mass, whether there are a hundred people present or no, or no one's present. You know? And sadly, during this lockdown, uh, we have not had as many masses uh, private or public, um, and so we're we're losing the graces, and, and the country is going it's going even getting even worse because we're not having uh, all those those masses said, and it's a shame. That's, the deep that's true. Are, Although let me add about that, I think there's a there's a silver lining on this dark cloud of the, oh, the lockdown. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> love uh, to hear it. And, and that is, you know, I'm in I'm in touch with a lot of priests and a lot of seminarians around the world, actually, and especially in this country. Um, and there was a significant uptick in the number of traditional Latin masses during during this COVID period, because it, it there are many priests out there who wish they could do it, but their pastoral responsibilities prevent them from doing it. Maybe they can only do it once a week or once a month. Mm -hmm. But during the lockdown, they were able to do it every day. So that definitely went up. The number of daily Trinity masses went up. And also a number of priests took advantage of the time to learn it because they just had the leisure suddenly to learn it. So I think quite possibly there are more Latin masses going on right now than, than at any time since the Second Vatican Council. Wow, that's the, Doc, good. Dr. Peter, let me ask you a question. Uh, some people say, hey, well, why don't we just, if you're so concerned about externals, why don't we just bring those things into the Novus Ordo Missae, you know, have the priest face east, have some Latin chant and so on. Yeah. I mean, isn't that enough? Yes. Yeah. So unquestionably, those things would be an improvement, right? Yeah. You brought up the priest facing eastwards. This is as ancient a Christian symbol as it gets. You know, Christians have been worshiping towards the east since the very beginning. And notice, they're not worshiping towards Mecca or towards Jerusalem like Jews and Muslims. It's not a geographical, it, it's not, it's not we're turning towards a holy city or a temple. It's we're turning to the rising sun which is the symbol of Christ in his glorious resurrection and his second coming, right? So it's, an or, it's a Christocentric orientation. We're centering ourselves on the Christ who is to come. And therefore the whole community, people and priests are facing together outwards to our Lord, right? Um, this is hugely important because it, it sends the visceral signal, no rational arguments necessary. It sends the signal that our worship orients us all outside of ourselves, outside of our particular community to God uh, and to our savior. He is our savior. He is our end. Or we're, we're like, uh, we're, we're like a, an arrow that's being shot to the East, right? That's, that's what the traditional liturgy and the, the orientation says. 
when the priest is facing the people, it turns it into what Ratzinger calls a closed circle, right? This local chummy community where people are looking at each other and kind of affirming one another and so on. It becomes a form of psych psychotherapy, essentially, right? This is, this is a completely wrong. Yeah. So, so it would be it would be good to have the priest facing east in a Novus Ordo Mass. It would be good to have some of the parts of the Mass in Latin and, and chant, Gregorian chant, right? Unquestionably, because this would help people to be more devout. It would lead them into the dimension of mystery that we were talking about. Okay, but the problem is those things only go so far. They're very important. I just defended that. But they only go skin, they, right? That's yeah, they, they are they are, so to speak, cosmetic. There are, there are deeper issues in the liturgical wars. I, I, I hesitate to use that word, but the, the debates between the Novus Ordo and the Tridentine, there, there are deeper issues. For example, what do the prayers actually say, right? This is something that I've really specialized in. I'm not the only one who, who does it. There's another scholar named Lauren Pristis who has written a whole book about this subject. But when you drill into the prayers that are said in the mass, for example, the opening prayer, the collect, the secret or the prayer over the over the offerings, the post communion prayer, they are quite different, sometimes radically different between the Trinitine Mass and the Novus Ordo. So what we're praying for and what we're praying about can be different. For example, they take out, you know, the old prayers often talk about ask the Lord for the grace to despise worldly goods and to long for the for the goods of heaven, for heavenly goods, right? Those are that that's been taken out of the Novus Ordo prayers. Um, the old prayers talk about penance and reparation. They talk about death, right? They talk about the fear of the Lord. They talk about really serious stuff that we have, that we need to hear about and we need to pray for. And a lot of that's just been stripped out. It's like it's sanitized. You know, the new prayers are sanitized, you know, um, and that's very problematic. Also, there are big chunks of the mass that were removed, right. like the, the offertory in particular, um, which when you study the offertory prayers, they are magnificent. Right. They came into the liturgy in the early Middle Ages, like so many other things we do, like the Palm Sunday procession. You know, they, these these offertory prayers developed in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages. And for a thousand years, every priest prayed these offertory prayers, which so clearly articulate the sacrificial nature of the mass, um, how he's praying for his own sins and the sins of the people, um, his the mediation of the priest and of Christ, the high priest, right? These are very profound prayers and they were literally stripped out of the Novus Ordo, right? And I could go on and on. The prayers at the foot of the altar are not there. The last gospel is not there. So it's, you're dealing with a denuded liturgy. You're dealing with a stripped down sort of shivering, begging waif. Uh, and that's what you're looking at. That's, and that's a real problem. Okay, we'll be right back. We're gonna ask uh, the professor some additional questions. Don't wanna miss it. Don't change that dial. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code, the NPR, to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com code VMPR live porn free thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio thank you God bless you keep the faith Hebrews 11.3 says by faith we come to understand according to St. Augustine understanding is the reward of faith Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. May God grant us a strong living faith in Him and His divine plan of salvation, 
and help us to believe so that we may understand. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we are back. We are uh, we have a special guest with us today, uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. And uh, he, we're talking about his new, latest book, Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright, The Genius. I'm, I'm holding it up right here. And Timeliness of the Traditional Latin Mass. And uh, it's an apologetics book, really, for those people that are serious about the worship of God. If you want to know all the nuances, this is the this is the magnum opus of uh, of, of the sacred liturgy, in my opinion, in terms of comparing uh, the, the ordinary and the extraordinary right. And in this book, you're going to you'll get a, a complete understanding of the superiority of language, music, prayers, postures, reverence and piety. And uh, it was written by a scholar. Uh, Dr. Peter Kaznuski is he's done his homework and a great service to Holy Mother of the Church. Uh, Dr. Peter, I wrote a book. It's called The Devil in the City of Angels. I just want to digress a little bit. I've noticed that in the Latin Mass, there is reference to angels and, 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 and the spiritual realm. I don't see that reference as much in the Novus Ordo Mass in the liturgy. I think uh, maybe one prayer in the Novus Ordo Mass, it says take take our prayers uh, made, you know, to, to God. But in the in the Latin Mass, I've noticed there's more reference to the angelic, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, and that's that's something that, that I think is also, you know, you asked uh, earlier in the program about differences between the Old Missal and the New Missal, the Tridentine Missal and the Novus Ordo Missal. And this is a crucial area of difference, right? The reality of the angelic realm, the nine orders of angels, right, about which so many church fathers and, and, and doctors have written, uh, so beautifully, um, that is that permeates the traditional liturgy, not just in the preface. That's where it remains in the Novus Ordo. It's always in the preface, uh, but in the Roman Canon, in the in the other prayers of the Mass at a, at a solemn High Mass for the incensation, the you know the, the angel Michael is mentioned at the end of a Low Mass. There's always the prayer to the Archangel Michael. In the calendar of the traditional rite, there are five feasts for the angels. There are only two in the Novus Ordo calendar. Um, so I mean, you could you can when you really get into the into the details, you start to see that in the tra the traditional mass, quite naturally, you might say, breathes the this air of faith in the invisible realm. You know that we are surrounded by angels, and that's why you often see in traditional Catholic churches there are statues of angels bowing towards the altar, right, where the sacrifice will take place. Well, that's really happening at mass. You know, there are angels all over the place. Our eyes are so weak; we're such weak. You know creatures, rational animals, that we can't see the angelic realm, but we know that it's there and it's more real. And in scripture, in scripture, whenever somebody meets an angel, they fall flat on their face in terror right. because these beings are so powerful, right? Let me just mention something else too. When we when we defend traditional Catholicism, it's not just about the mass. The mass is the crown jewel, I like to say, but a crown jewel is set into a crown. And the whole crown should be beautiful. It should be cut. It should be gold and covered with with precious and semi precious stones. So the mass might be that big, huge emerald or diamond, but you also have the divine office or the breviary. You have the other sacramental rites: baptism, confirmation, or ordination, matrimony. Um, you know, and so you have blessings and processions and all kinds of things that form the rich pageantry mm -hmm. of the Catholic liturgy, right? Um, and all of those rites were changed, every last one of them radically changed in some cases, most cases, mm -hmm. um, in the liturgical reforms. And one of the things they did to the rite of baptism was they took out the exorcisms. There are really substantial exorcisms in the traditional rite of baptism. There's an exorcism of the child because the ch we are born into the domain of Satan and all of us are, are sort of, so to speak, you know, 
we are we are in a way the property of the prince of this world and the rite of baptism tears us out of that and says you belong to god alone now it makes that very clear pretty, almost shockingly clear right and it also exercises the salt that is going to be put into the water to make the traditional holy water right um, and so if you look at the rite of baptism, the, the presence of the angelic realm is very clear there. And we've lost that and we need to get it back. That's right. Ruben, question? Yeah. Uh, you're right. And, and you know, I, it reminds me of a, pope, uh, a quote by Pope Leo I. He says, he, sees, he that sees another in error and endeavors not to correct it testifies himself to the error. And what we've seen happen for over the last, well, what, 50 years now um, since the, uh, the change in mass it's been a divide in the church and and we have seen uh i mean you could go in the in the past to go to any city and you could take part in the mass and it was in latin yes. so it was a common yes. language it brought us all together it was unity but it's it's almost as uh you know the tower of babel so we're we we'll go to different countries and we have to hear it in the in the vernacular and we don't understand it, it yes it is really yeah divided. and and that point about language i mean Talk about a, a, a fascinating subject, right? So somebody might initially say, okay, well, Latin, why is that better? That's a foreign language too. It's an ancient, archaic, dead language. You know, it's difficult. It's a difficult language that some say. I mean, I don't think it's particularly more difficult than any other language, but, um, you know, so they say it's, it's all, you know, it's so foreign. Shouldn't we have, shouldn't we be in our vernacular language so we can understand everything? And my answer to that is, I have multiple answers. One is, mm. If you think you understand what's going on in the divine worship of the Almighty God, of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have no clue what you're talking about because that is incomprehensible. You can understand a little bit of it. You can sort of touch the, the edge of the garment of it. And, and, and with you, know, you can apply your mind to understanding the faith and you can see glints of light here and there and see more and more. But it is fundamentally an incomprehensible mystery. And if the liturgy doesn't tell you somehow, if it doesn't have a way of telling you you are entering into the domain of something which is so vast and so much greater than you that you have to humble yourself before it, right? Then there's a problem. There's a real problem. But on the other side, on the other hand, if you hear the same Latin prayers over and over again, especially the repeating parts of the mass, the Gloria, the Sanctus, the Pater Noster, you get used to them in a certain sense. So you know what they're saying. You can read it in your missal. Right. You get used to it. So there's a kind of comforting aspect. It's both strange, sacred, remote, and comforting and recognizable and it's catholic you know that it's catholic and so wherever you go in the world you can enter any church to a latin mass and right away you're both brought into the mystery of the presence of god and you're at home right isn't that an amazing yeah, thing that you can both be at home and yet reminded of the strangeness of god right both of those things go together with the vernacular you lose both of those things and some some of my friends will say well you i can't even hear the priest he's, he's whispering well he's not that's not part it's not for you he's speaking to god you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you, know, you you even cover that in the book dr peter you say I, I understand it now this the priest is speaking he's not on a microphone and he's speaking softly because we're entering into the mystery and it, it like makes you want to lean more into like what's he saying he's mm -hmm. he's talking to god wow yes. he's yes. just entered into the holy of holies he's yes. in there i'm witnessing this so to me i get it now that speaking without a microphone and just in just a soft language i can see wow this is right now he's entering he's breaking right into the holy of holies and i'm right behind him he's leading me yes. so i get it i don't have to hear everything that he's saying and you you yeah. cover that in the book yeah no it's true and in, and in fact this is a psychological paradox that if you want something to become fascinating if you wanted to draw people in you have to sort of almost ignore them and put all your attention on this other thing. Uh, you know, so the, the distance, the Latin mass creates a kind of distance between the people and the priest, but the effect of that distance is like a highly charged electrified distance. It draws you in, it doesn't push you out, right? If, if everything becomes too comfortable and too comprehensible, you get bored. It's like, well, I, yeah, I, I've been there. I know that. I know what's going on. I'm so bored with this, right? You, so there's, there's a paradox there. We have to challenge. There has to be an element of challenge, an element of like climbing the steep, craggy mountain, right, to get the view from the top, right? I mean, if you just go and stand on a 10-foot hill, 
all you can see is your neighbor's yard. But if you climb up a mountain, it's difficult. And what you see from the top is breathtaking, right? So I think that's very much the difference between the new and the old. Some people would argue, doctor, that, uh, hey, the, the Novus Ordo Mass has a three-year cycle of reading and the old liturgical calendar <laughs> has less scripture in the, in, in, uh, or, or less scripture is read. How would you uh, respond to somebody that says that? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is something I've written a lot about. Um, so I used to think, too, oh, what a great thing that the new Mass has so much more scripture in it. And then it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks one day, you know, that the mass is not a Bible study. This is not, we're not going here to just learn stuff that we need to, we're going to need to make an effort to learn elsewhere. That is, when people go to mass and they hear sort of bucket loads of scripture pouring over them, it doesn't stick very well. You know, we kind of want to get on to the real meat of the, of the affair. We want to worship God, or at least that's why we ought to be there. And sometimes these long readings and, and multiple readings and then a long homily about the readings, it's so much verbosity. It, it's, it's like drowning in words, you know, <laughs> and, and we're not able, it's, it, look, it's not a Bible study. So you're never going to be able to understand that much scripture at mass. And what ends up happening, in fact, is that the whole scriptural part, the so-called liturgy of the word, just overshadows the liturgy of the Eucharist. And in my experience, mm. it's much longer. The liturgy of the Eucharist is like horses out of the gate. Let's go, let's take the shortest Eucharistic prayer, number right. two, which is the one written at a cafe in Trastevere, you know, and, you know, or finished at a cafe. You know, let's take the fastest Eucharistic prayer. Let's multiply the extraordinary minister. Let's get everybody out of here because the main thing, i.e. the scripture study has been done. I mean, that is such a Protestantization of Catholic worship. Yeah. We are there for the holy sacrifice of the mass. And the scriptural readings are meant to turn our minds and our hearts to that sacrifice. So what I've noticed over all these decades of worshiping in the traditional Latin mass, I've, I've actually, for many decades, I went to both. So I really compared these things intimately. And that's, I, I see that as a privilege. You know, some people might see that as a, as a cross. Like, well, why didn't you just go to the traditional Latin mass? But I, I get to compare these things in detail because I know them both in detail, right? So what I've noticed about the, the readings of the traditional mass is that they are short. They tend to be very short. There are some exceptions, but they're very short. They're extremely practical in terms of like telling us the hard moral lessons we need to hear. For example, there are three readings in a row just in, in recent Sundays after Pentecost that, that warn people against fornication. You know, mm. how often do you hear that in the Novus Ordo with this three year cycle? You know, so many readings, you don't hear this stuff. Yep. Right. Yeah. And the readings in the old mass have a kind of Eucharistic orientation. That is, they often emphasize miracles of our Lord that that have a Eucharistic resonance to them. So it's pointed towards the sacrifice. That's right. Hold that thought, uh, Professor. We're going to be right back on our final segment. Don't, sure. change, don't change that dial. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her, because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence 
Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. May we always be motivated by true love for God and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, where iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. We have a special guest uh, today with us, Professor Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, and uh, we're talking about his new book. Here it is. I'm holding it up. The Genius and Timelessness of the Traditional Latin Mass. You can get it from Angelical Press. Angelical Press. This is an apologetics book for those of you eggheads that like apologetics like myself. This is the <laughs> apolo- this is the apologetics standard so that you can understand uh, the ordinary and the extraordinary form of the Mass. Here it is. Reclaiming our Roman Catholic birthright, Dr. Peter Kaznuski. He's done the church, Holy Mother Church a great favor. Hey, somebody sent me a, a cute little joke uh, regarding the, the show that we're doing today. You probably heard this, uh, Ruben and, 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 and Peter, you probably heard this. It goes like this. A person went to the priest after Mass and said, Father, I don't speak Latin. I can't understand all those words you say at Mass. Father said, that's okay. I wasn't speaking to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, you, Absolutely. You know, uh, Professor, um, I, I'm... When I, I obviously I, I don't have uh, access to the Latin Mass during the week, so I, I if I go to daily Mass, it has to be at the Nova Soto. And you were talking about all the prayers that have been cut out, and I, I bring my Latin Missal, and I try to follow along as much as I can. But then we get to the canon of the Mass, and boom, I have to skip ahead like three or four pages, you know, just to, because the Eucharistic prayer jumps right into it. It's it, There's so many things that are missing. You know, in the Latin Mass, you, you've got the word oblation or sacrifice mentioned so many times. Yeah. It's clear yeah. That this is what what we're what we're, we're witnessing, and also, uh, for instance, uh, the invocation of the saints. You know, a lot, all the the names of the saints have been taken out of there, mm-hmm. and 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 this one prayer in the uh, invocation of the saints to us also, thy sinful servants. Since when in the in the in the Novosoro do you hear them uh, us being called calling ourselves sinful? I know, it's, I know. <laughs> it's just yeah, not look. Well, what we have to understand is this, and a lot of people don't want to hear this, but they need to know it because it's the truth and the truth liberates, right? The truth sets us free. The Novus Ordo Mass was designed by people who either disagreed with or even hated the theology that was expressed in the traditional mass, the mass that the church had had pretty much unchanged for 400 years. Yes. And prior to that, for many, many centuries with very little change. So realistically speaking, we're talking about a 1600 year, right? 1,600 years of organically developing worship in the West in Latin. That was that that was a monolithic reality of Catholic life until 19, the mid 60s is when things really started falling apart. And then 69 is when the Novus Ordo was put in yeah. into place. And the people who designed the Novus Ordo, they disagreed with the theology that was in the old right. Okay. Bonini, be, be, Bonini with, with the, being one of yeah. them, right? Absolutely. Well, he was the architect. He was the main coordinator, the kind of mover and shaker. Right. Um, But they disagreed with calling, you know, the the emphasis on sinfulness. They thought it was too dour, you know, too down about earthly goods. They wanted to be more optimistic and upbeat. They thought it was too focused on sacrifice. They wanted to bring in the meal emphasis, the, the way the Protestants had done, you know, I mean, on and on and on and on. And every single thing they held was had either been condemned earlier in the history of the church or was characteristic of Protestant and ecumenical uh, movements. Yeah. And so we, we, people need to wake up to the fact that what's in the Novus Ordo, it's not erroneous. That is, you can't look at it and say, ah, there's a heresy, but it's inadequate. It's not fully Catholic. It does not express the fullness of the Catholic faith. And that can be demonstrated. That's not a conspiracy theory. Right. 
I, and you know, uh, Scott Hahn was uh, would would uh, say, you know, when the uh, the good becomes the enemy of the best, when it keeps you from the best, you know. So uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And and uh, yeah. one thing I noticed at, at mass at the traditional Latin mass. There's a lot of young families coming with children, and that's really uh, heartening. You know, it's it's uplifting, and it touches my heart because I know the the future is bright, and and a, a lot of people in my our neck of the woods are gravitating to this the the, the mass of all time, and uh, but a lot of parents might think you know this all sounds nice, but I could never take my little kids, uh, you know, to a long mm-hmm. uh, elaborate mass. You know, they'd squirm, they'd scream, and. Uh, that that hasn't been the case for me. I I see when I compare the two, the children are behave much better in the Latin Mass than they do in the Novus Ordo. I, I don't yeah. know. It's just the parents are better. Yeah, yeah. The parents. Oh yeah, more. that's a. Good, yeah. What do you say to that? So you know, um, I'm glad you brought that up because actually, in in my new book, I have four chapters mm-hmm. about children and families and parents and how important it is to children for their formation to bring them to the traditional Latin Mass, um, and for them to have that as their formative and informative. Uh, influence. Um, Look, uh, there's so much one could say about this. We don't believe what we don't see. Mm. What we need to see, it's kind of like seeing is believing, right? So if people say, oh, we believe that Jesus is really present in the Holy Eucharist. Well, show me, show me that you believe that by your words, by your actions, by your attitudes, right? So the traditional Latin Mass is the ultimate demonstration physically and verbally (laughs) and musically and so on of what we believe as Catholics. Children pick that up, children absorb it. They're like sponges, right? They absorb that, they, they know what's going on. They detect hypocrisy instantly. They can see when people are walking the walk and talking the talk, even if they don't have the vocabulary to express that, they, they see right through fakeness, right? And, and, that's, and so when, when you bring a child to a resplendent high mass with all the smells and bells, with the beautiful vestments, with you know the choir singing in Latin and so on, they know that something's up, right? They, this is this is something very different from just the local jamboree, you know, with with Susan of the parish council or whatever, right? I mean, this is they know that there's a radical difference. Something is going on here now. Of course, they're going to still need to be educated, right? The parents still need to tell them not to squirm around and you've got to kneel and don't put your behind on the pew and you know all these usual little things. And sometimes they're going to have to take the kids out and give them a little talking to. But the point is that overall, the atmosphere is encouraging prayer. It's encouraging meditation. It's encouraging acts of faith and adoration. And this is, if you want to develop habits, this is how you develop habits, right? I talk in one chapter about how the the traditional liturgy is the ultimate school for teaching children to say, I love you, thank you, I'm sorry, and please to God, right? The four things that we want children who are well-behaved to be able to do, those are just writ large in in the old mass, right? So I guess I would say the paradox is that if you want your children to behave at mass, take them to a mass that is utterly serious about worshiping God and let them pick up on that and absorb it and and kind of get into that. It's not going to happen instantly, but it will happen. And that's why it can even be better to take them to a longer liturgy where there's more going on, more to look at, more music, you know, more more incense rather than like a half an hour 45 minute low mass silent low mass right because that's like that's pretty hardcore asceticism like most you know <laughs> but i'm not even sure most adults are ready to sit still for a half an hour you know let alone squirmy kids so give the children something to look at that's what that's why the high mass is so important there dr peter you know right now the the usccb they're trying to figure out ways to get catholics back to the church as a result of this shutdown yeah. And uh, I, I think only like I've heard that 20 to 25 percent of Catholics have returned back to mass. Uh, and so that that's a huge, huge. Uh, I mean, we're, we're bleeding out bad. Yes. Uh, but yes. but yet I see, for example, here at the FSSP church that I attend here in downtown Phoenix, I think like 95 percent of the people have returned. And as I talk to people around the country, they say that their numbers are like 95 to 98 percent of the people have returned yes. mm-hmm. in the regular Nova Soto mess, like 20 to 25 yeah. percent of the people have returned. I think the bishops yeah. should read your book. Yeah, I hope they will. <laughs> there is, by the way, there's one archbishop in Papal Nuncio who uh, plugged the book on the back cover, Archbishop Thomas Gulickson. Oh, so I just yeah. want to throw that out there in case people are thinking, oh, Kwasniewski is so far out he's so far right that you know even the bishops should condemn him or something well here's a papal nuncio archbishop who's who's saying you know uh, good job good you know keep going but um but yeah no the the my goodness 
uh, Father Zulsdorf lo- likes to talk about what he calls a demographic sinkhole. Okay, mm-hmm. a demographic sinkhole. He says the Catholic Church is headed to a point of massive collapse, institutionally speaking. And that's true. The schools are failing. Yes. The religious orders that have never gone traditional have, have not have not recovered their tradition. They're dying. Um, the Catholic parishes are shrinking, are going to shrink, especially after COVID, right? So why is this the case? Because there is not staying power. There's not a magnetism in those things, right? When the religious get rid of their habits, when the Catholic schools water everything down and dumb things down and take out the faith, when the parishes are just, you know, doing something which is rather boring and verbose, I mean, none of this is going to cause people to like be committed to it to the point of martyrdom. I mean, nobody's nobody would take it seriously. But the traditional parishes, they're giving people, you know, hardcore Catholicism, right? Straight up, like straight up whiskey or whatever. You know, this is the real thing. <laughs> and, and people know it when they see it, right? right. You know, like, you're, this is not baloney. You're not pulling my leg. This is the real deal. Um, and so I, I've heard not only that people have come back after COVID, but that there's growth in a lot of a lot of places, you know, that more people are coming to mass, new families. Yes. Yeah. Hey, get the book. Uh, this is the the genius and timelessness of the traditional Latin mass written by Dr. Peter Kaznuski, Angelical Press. You can get it from Amazon as well. If you want to know, I mean, if you want one book that describes to you the differences and the organic development and just all the questions you've ever had about the Latin mass, this is the book to get. Uh, you've done a great favor to the to the church, uh, Dr. Peter. Uh Hey, give us a minute, a parting shot. Why would you recommend uh, the average lay Catholic that's never experienced Latin Mass? What would you say to them in a minute uh, why they should uh, peek over the fence and take a look at the Latin Mass as uh, as, as uh, their possible parish? Yeah, I, I think the answer is as simple as what you were saying way at the beginning of the program. You know, don't you want to know how so many centuries of great saints worshiped God. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to pray the way St. Thomas Aquinas prayed or St. Teresa of Jesus or St. Francis of Assisi or St. Augustine or St. You know, St. Catherine of Siena, you know, you could go on and on St. Louis de Montfort, whatever favorite saint you have, Mm -hmm. there's the, you know, there's a 99% chance that they were shaped and formed and deeply influenced by the traditional Latin mass. I mean, and this is our Catholic heritage, right? This is our Catholic birthright. That's right. That's right. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that today is the feast day of St. Philomena. I know in traditional circles, she's a very powerful saint. And uh, I mean, all over the church, but I I see it more so because when they took her off the calendar, Mm -hmm. people forgot about her in the new mass. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, St. Philomena, pray for us. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and also, you know, they they were, they were, uh, there were about 300 saints removed from the calendar in the Novus Ordo reform. And that's another we're, problem, right? We're going we to have to bring love our back, older brothers yeah. and sisters. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Peter, we need a part two on this. This is too good. Right, yes. Ruben? Yes. Yes. We'd love to have you back. Yeah. Doctor. Thanks a lot, Dr. Peter. We're going to have you back over and over again, because I want to go through your, there's so <laughs> many questions I have to ask you. And uh, you've done a, a big favor to the church. Hey, if you like what you hear, then like us, hit the subscribe button and share the show with other people. I'm sure a lot of people can be benefited by the information that we've provided. Ruben, take it away. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Remember, uh, we'll be at the Cathedral, LA Cathedral on Sunday from uh, 11 to 1, praying and uh, requesting from the Archbishop to open our churches fully. Be there, join us. Stay tuned for Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Mishuda from the Midwest Command Center. God bless you. We're 10-7. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.